So a pleasant day, dear doctors, and welcome to our master class in correlative anatomy and surgery. Now, theoretically, this will cover the subject anatomy, but because of the approach and because of the multimodal sources of references and the clinical correlation, you will experience today a horizontal integration of just how basic and core anatomic concepts will actually cross over to several other subjects like histology, even biochemistry, even pharmacology, even pathology and internal medicine, and of course, surgery. So this is what we're going to expect for this master class session. And I want everyone to just sit back just take note of what I'm emphasizing and tell yourself these are the things you have to know before you head to your exam. Now, these are the Master Guru references for this module. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight references to cover anatomy. You will realize even in the actual exam and in actual clinical practice, that you cannot divide your patient into subjects. But rather, when you approach a patient from history taking to physical exam to diagnostic and therapeutics and intervention, the patient is always approached holistically and there's always a correlation of several subjects. And that is what the CDB curriculum is going to teach you. So take note, we have the following very important references. Recently in the boards, BRS has been touched. We have Snell, Netter, Blumen Fawcett Histology, Harper's Biochemistry, clinic Clinically Oriented by Moore, Absite Surgery, and Swartz Principles of Surgery. So if you have never experienced before in your whole academic life, a conversion of these many references, congratulations for choosing the master class because now you will be exposed to what the real curriculum is and you will have the CDB edge. So this is our course outline for this module. I'm gonna go over the skeletal system I'm going to go over the pearls of the head and the neck. And later on, we will touch the abdomen. We're going to touch the other major systems. So let's begin our journey. And let's begin with the skeletal system. Okay. Now, I have this presumption a lot of you are probably in this state. Okay. And that's probably why you're joining the master class, ultimate last ditch final coaching. Don't worry, you will not have any regrets. So let's start with the histologic concept of the bone tissue. Now, I want everyone to remember that the bone tissue is comprised of collagen type one. Okay, collagen type one. Now, another thing I want you to remember is that there are actually three major types, okay, three major types, okay, of bone cells. First, we have the osteocytes, we have the osteoblasts, then we have the osteoclasts, okay? So please Take note of that. Now, the functional unit of the bone tissue is the ostium. And I want everyone to remember that. So always remember collagen type 1, okay, is the bone. So the bone looks like a number one. Okay, so please take note 
of that. Okay. Now, another must know, the histology behind the bone, the biochemistry behind the bone. So the bone is comprised of a connective tissue, which has a matrix, which is composed of collagen fibers, which we mentioned earlier is collagen type one. And this is responsible for the flexibility as well as the tensile strength of the bone. The calcium is there for the rigidity. In fact, many references would say 99% of calcium actually comes from the bone. Now, there is a substance here which is responsible for the hardness of the bone. And this is what we call the hydroxy appetite. So what actually is hydroxyapatite from a biochemical aspect? This is calcium phosphate hydroxide. Okay, calcium phosphate hydroxide. So again, three key words to bring with you to the boards. The bone is collagen type one. It's made out of calcium and it's made out of hydroxy appetite. Now, let us give you this guru guide and let us go over some keywords and please engage with me in the chat box. So what disease pops into your head? If you're given a case of frequent fractures, a barrel shaped chest, a curved spine, and a blue sclerae. What disease pops into your mind? Okay, perfect. This is osteogenesis imperfecta, commonly known as OI. Now, let's add some testmanship here. Of these four keywords or key phrases that I mentioned, what do you think is the giveaway? Yung pinaka unique the giveaway. Great. I agree with you. It is the blue sclerae. Okay. Now, question. What does Robin's pathology say is the chemical process which occurs and is responsible for the blue sclerae? Would anyone happen to know? This is actually found in your core printed handouts in pathology. What is responsible for the blue sclerae. This is caused by tindalization. There is a reflection okay, of light on the sclerae, particularly the underlying blood vessels in the sclerae. And because of this reflection or this process of tindalization, the sclerae now appears to be blue. Okay, so please Take note of that. Now, don't forget the other name of osteogenesis imperfecta. The other name of osteogenesis imperfecta is brittle bone disease. Okay. Again, it is brittle bone disease. So please take note of this. Okay. We know this is going to come out. Okay, again, we know this is going to pop out. Okay. Again, please take note of this. Now next, here are some photos of osteogenesis imperfecta. 
I mean, I would like to give you the hint of the curves or the scoliosis. Now, what do we call scoliosis, which occurs at the thoracic vertebrae? What type of scoliosis is that? Or what type of bone deformity? Okay, what's the thoracic? Okay, thoracic is kyphosis. Okay, thoracic is kyphosis. Now, what if I give you the keyword of gibbous? What is your diagnosis or most likely diagnosis, especially if you're dealing with patients in the Philippines? Okay, great. This is most likely tuberculosis of the bone, which we commonly call POTS disease, okay? Which we commonly call POTS disease. So please take note of this, okay? Now here, here's the blue sclerae. There you go, okay? And here's the scoliosis. Now, question. What pops into your head? Okay, this is your guru guide. Bow legs, knock knees, stunted growth, and cranial tabus. What pops into your head when you hear these words? What pops into your head when you hear these words? Okay, very good, very good. So this is classical, okay? Whoops, there's a little one here. Why congenital syphilis? Is this congenital syphilis? Bow legs, not knees, stunted growth. Be careful, okay? This is not congenital syphilis, okay? This is, of course, rickets, okay? And rickets is vitamin D deficiency in adults, okay? Now, very quick reminder, okay? Very quick reminder. For the metabolism of the bone, particularly the hormones and the vitamins, okay, I want you to remember the following. Number one is calcium. Vitamin D, which the active form is polycalciferol, okay, and this is also known as calcitriol. Then, of course, is the role of phosphate and parathyroid hormone, okay? So bone metabolism, these are the four must-know pearls, okay? Calcium, vitamin D, phosphate, and parathyroid hormone. Now question, what hormone is produced by the thyroid gland and it decreases, let me change my arrow, it decreases calcium levels. What hormone produced by the thyroid gland, what hormone produced by the thyroid gland decreases the levels of calcium, okay? This is calcitonin, okay? Now, if you must know, always remember bone is called osseous tissue. If you hear the word chondro, then that would mean cartilage, okay? Cartilage is chondro, bone is osho. So bone is formed through a process known as ossification. Now ossification is a gradual process. In other words, when the baby is born, not all bones are ossified. And the fetal skeleton will basically form. It will be formed from a cartilage model. Okay. Now, 
question. What is the first bone to undergo ossification? What is the first bone to undergo ossification? Okay, so it's right there in front of you. It's the clavicle, okay? The clavicle is the first bone to undergo ossification. And what specific type of ossification does the clavicle undergo? It's not the usual type of ossification. This is the same type of ossification for the skull, okay? The skull bones, okay? This is the famous intramembranous ossification, okay? Intramembranous ossification, okay? So please take note of this, okay? Please take note of this. Now, we mentioned three bone cells earlier, okay? Osteocyte, osteoblast, osteoclast. Sites, blasts, class. Now, I want everyone to remember this. Osteoclast sounds like clash clashing or fighting, there is destruction. There is breakdown. So osteoclast, clash to clash, means to destroy or to break down. Okay? The blasts are the bone-forming cells. So please be reminded of that. Okay? Now, let's compare compact bone versus the cancellous or the spongy bone. The compact bone is also known as the cortical bone, okay? The cortical bone or the compact bone, as the name implies, is dense and it is hard. The compact bone forms the outer layer of the bone, okay? It forms the outer layer of the bone. So please take note of that. Now, you usually find the compact bone. You usually find the compact bone in the epiphysis and the diaphysis. Now, question, what type of bone would you find an epiphysis and a diaphysis? What type of bone? Okay, in what type of bone would you encounter the epiphysis and the diaphysis? Okay, you usually encounter this in the long bone. So the keywords again for the compact bone, it's also known as the cortical. So letter C for compact is letter C for cortical. As the name implies, it's dense and it is hard. And what is responsible again for the hardness of the bone? What is that famous? What is that famous? Okay. Uh, material or substance responsible for the hardness of the bone, okay, that is, of course, hydroxyapatite, okay, hydroxyapatite. So please take note of that. Now, what about the cancellous bone? This is also known as the spongy bone. Histologically and grossly, you would see a lot of spaces. And in the cancellous bone, this is where you see the red bone marrow. And this is responsible for hematopoiesis, so particularly the production of the blood cells. So the cancellous bone, not cancerous, but cancellous bone. Please take note of this. The cancellous bone. So that produces the blood cells. Now, in this figure, you see here the compact bone, 
which is the outer layer. Inside is the spongy. So this is how the spongy would look like. You see a lot of pores or spaces there. Okay. And this is the entire ostrom, which is, of course, considered to be the basic functional, functional or structural unit of a bone. So here's another photo. You have here the ostroms. Okay. Here's the compact bone in a very beautiful illustration showing you the cancellous or the spongy bone. And always remember here, you would see the medullary marrow cavity. Okay. Now, question What structure allows one ostron to communicate with another ostron? What structure allows one ostron? communicate with another ostrom. Okay, very good. So you have your haversion canals. Okay, you have the haversion canals. Now, I made a table here for you guys, which of course I'll share with you guys later after you listen to the session. If we go back to our basics, there are actually four shapes of bones. We have the long bones. Okay. We have the short bones, we have the flat bones, then we have the irregular bones, long, short, flat, and irregular. When you say irregular, it doesn't fall under the previous three classifications of either becoming being long, short, or flat. Now, when we say long, that means the bone is longer than wide. When we say short, it's as long as wide. Okay, the flat bones are plate shaped, while the irregular bones do not comply with the previous shapes. Now, the example of the long bone is the femur and the humerus. Example of the short bones are the carpals and the tarsals. Example of the flat bones is the sternum, the scapula, and the pelvis. An example of the irregular bone is the vertebrae. Okay, now, hands on your keypads. Let's have a little coaching blitz, okay? So let's have a little coaching blitz. So number one, what would you usually encounter if there's a fracture of a long bone and suddenly the patient presents with difficulty of breathing and develops hypotension? You have a patient with a fracture of a long bone, suddenly presents with difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, tachypnea, and hypotension. Okay, very good. This is a fat embolism until proven otherwise. Okay, a fat embolism until proven otherwise. Now next, what is the most common dislocated carpal bone? The most common dislocated carpal bone. The most common dislocated carpal bone is the lunate. And what is the most common fractured carpal bone? What is the most common fractured carpal bone? Okay, fractured is the scaphoid. Okay, it is the scaphoid bone, fractured. Now, question, if the scaphoid bone is fractured, what blood vessel is usually injured? If the scaphoid bone is fractured, what blood vessel is usually injured? Okay, very good. It's the radial artery. Okay, again, it is the radial artery. Now, at what level is the inferior level of the scapula. At what level is the inferior level of the scapula? Inferior. Okay, this is at the level of T7. Okay. Now question, what is known as the point of the scapula? The point of the scapula. 
okay, what is known as the point of the scapula. It's the most prominent part of the scapula. Okay, the most prominent and the point of the shoulder, or the point of the scapula, that is known as the acromion. Okay, that is known as the acromion. Okay, very, very good. Now let's just say this is your scapula. It's an ugly looking scapula. Okay, what do we call this structure here? Right here, which divides the scapula into a supra, scapular fossa, and an infra. Okay, that's the spine of the scapula. That is the spine of the scapula. Okay, very good. Now, for the gross anatomy of the long bone, we mentioned the diaphysis and the epiphysis. So always remember the diaphysis is composed of compact bone, while the epiphysis is mostly spongy. Okay, diaphysis is composed of compact bone. So this is the shaft or the middle of the bone. The epiphysis is at the end. So always remember this letter E. Epiphysis is letter E. It's at the end. Nasa dulo. This is found distal. Okay. So please take note of this. Okay. Again, please take note of this. So epiphysis is spongy. Diaphysis is compact. Okay, so please take note of that. Now let's highlight the diaphysis. Okay, so here, look at the photo. You have there the central shaft and you have the medullary cavity. Okay, this is where you find the yellow marrow. This is mostly fat. And what famous Filipino dish would you encounter in the yellow bone marrow? Okay, what famous Filipino dish? Okay, very good. You have uh, bulalo, puchero, okay. A lot of people fight for that. And now you have one recipe, the sizzling bulalo. Okay, that's basically yellow marrow. Uh, I call that a heart attack. Okay, that is super duper loaded with triglycerides and bad cholesterol. Okay, but again, mabenta siya, di ba? Very, very, very mabenta. Yes, can see it. That's correct. Now, I want you guys to remember that the wide ends of the long bone again, okay, nasa dulo, you have the E, the N, that's the epiphysis, okay, then of course you have the diaphysis, which is the shaft. So I want you to remember there's an articular cartilage there in the epiphysis. There is a articular cartilage there. The articular cartilage has two functions. One is to cover, okay, the epiphysis. Second is to prevent bones from rubbing on other bones, okay? Now, what do we call this structure here where the arrow is? What do we call this? That's the epiphyseal plate. Sorry, I just gave the answer. <laughs> okay, that's the epiphyseal growth plate, okay? And basically, that's very important. Now, growth hormone and thyroid hormone plays a very important role, okay, in the epiphyseal plate. Now, what if I tell you there is an excess of growth hormone before the epiphyseal plate closes? What condition would you encounter? Excess of growth hormone before the epiphyseal plate closes. This would lead to the condition gigantism. Okay, so I want everyone to remember this. Okay, now question. In the workup of someone with gigantism, aside from measuring growth hormone levels, okay, what laboratory would you order? What laboratory? Would you order? Okay, what laboratory would you order? OK, 
in what laboratory would you order? Somatomediums heading in the right direction. Okay. You order the insulin growth factor. Okay. You order the insulin growth factor. Okay. This is very important in your diagnosis. And at what time of the day would you expect? Uh, no, not what time of the day, but when would you expect a surge of growth hormone? Is it before sleep or after sleep? Is it before sleep or is it after sleep? When would you expect a surge of growth hormone levels? Is it before sleep or after sleep? Okay, it's after sleep. How many hours after sleep? How many hours after sleep? Okay, this is very physiology. Okay. Uh, the best answer here is one to two hours. Okay, one to two hours after sleep. You would expect you would expect a surge. Okay. You would expect a surge of your growth hormone. Okay. Now, what do we call that condition? If there's a deficiency in growth hormone before the epiphyseal plate closes. So growth hormone deficiency before the epiphyseal plate closes. Okay. So that is dwarfism. Okay. That is dwarfism. Baliktad, what if there's decreased growth hormone? Uh, no, sorry. What if there's increased growth hormone? Increased growth hormone, but the epiphyseal plate is already closed. What condition would that individual develop? Okay, this is now acromegaly. Okay, now, very good. Now, what drug would you give to treat acromegaly? What drug would you give? to treat acromegaly. Okay, very good. You would give ocreotide. Very good. I'd like to share with you a case. This is actually the second to the last case I saw last night. Uh, I finished clinic like almost eight o'clock last night in the evening. Uh, there was a female, okay, she's 21 years old, she was referred to me in the clinic last night. She had the chief complaint of blurring of vision. She also had the chief complaint of severe chronic headache. Now her blurring of vision was tunnel vision and she could not see at the sides. When I saw her, she was pretty big. She had very big hips. Her mask could not fit. Her chin actually was literally protruding and the mask could not cover her entire face. I asked permission and I asked her if she could remove the, her mask. And I politely asked her if she's noticed any changes in her facial features. The jaw was protruding, the forehead was very big. I noticed she had hirsutism, she had a lot of hair and she was a female. So I asked about her menstruation and it was very irregular. I asked her if there's any milk coming out of her, her breasts, okay? And she said, no. What would your impression be in this patient? Let's see if you can think. Put all the key features together. Headache, okay? There's headache. The patient had blurring of vision. The patient had irregular menses, very protruding very protruding jaw, big forehead, okay? So I see some answers here, adenoma, pituitary, okay, very good. This is a pituitary adenoma, which is most likely a prolactinoma. Now question, I have a very good question. What are those features in the face, which I just reported to you? What is that protruding jaw or the prognathism? Okay, this is very acromegaly. I did not tell you that she had very big hands, 
very big feet, but her hips were that of a football player, an American football player. Okay. So that's prognathism. The lion face that is leonine facies. Leonine facies is, is seen in lepromatous leprosy. Protruding jaw, that's prognathism. Now here, here's the famous epiphyseal plate or the growth plate. And let's try to make this as clinical as possible. So this is your clinical crossover. This is your guru guide. What drugs are contraindicated in children due to the side effect of early closure of the epiphyseal plate and cartilage damage? Okay, I see a couple of answers already. Okay, I see quinolones or ciprofloxacin. That is correct. I also see tetracyclines, doxycycline. Okay, very good. So these are the two drugs which are contraindicated in growing children because it closes the epiphyseal plate. There's premature closure of the epiphyseal plate. So we have quinolones represented by ciprofloxacin. Then we have cartilage damage and tendon rupture. So quinolones are bad for the cartilage and bones. Then we also have tetracyclines. So please take note of that. Okay. Now, tell me what pops into your head when you hear these keywords. Destruction of the diathesis. Okay, let me emphasize that. There's an onion skin periosteal reaction. There is an onion skin periosteal reaction. Okay, very good. This is Ewing's sarcoma. Okay, this is Ewing's sarcoma. So everyone got and should put this in their heads. Ewing's sarcoma. Okay, you guys see this face here? See that face? Look at that face. Okay, as despicable as it may be, this is one of the faces you're going to see during your exam. And this is one of the faces you're going to see in the finish line because I'm going to be waiting for my children. I'm going to wait for you to cross that finish line. Now, what you see here is the onion skin periosteal reaction. Here, this is a better picture, but this is not Ewing's. What is this? finding here. Okay, very good. This is osteosarcoma. And this, yes, you're very correct. This is the famous sunburst pattern. If this does not pop out in your exam, find me the tallest building in the Philippines and I will jump from the roof head first if this does not pop out, okay? So please take note of this. Now, there's a mention here of hair on end. Now, I would like to make a clarification here because there is actually another condition that presents with a hair on end finding, and it's actually pointing not much of osteosarcoma but rather another disease. Would anyone happen to know what is that disease, okay, which presents with a hair on the end? Okay, this is, yes, this is your beta thalassemia, okay? Beta thalassemia classically presents with the hair on end. So that's very good that this keyword or key phrase was mentioned. Okay, very good. Keep it up. Now, this is your guru guide. You're going to hear these keywords, sunburst reaction. And what is the most common primary bone tumor in children? Okay, correct answer. Very good. It's osteosarcoma. 
Okay. Now, what are the two radiologic findings of osteosarcoma? What are the two radiologic findings of osteosarcoma? The sunburst pattern is one. What is the second? Okay. The second is the Codman's triangle. So this is what you see here on the photo on the right. Okay. Codman's triangle. Please jot that down. Now, I made a little table here. Don't worry, you'll get a copy of this. Okay. Would you like a study guide here, a copy? Would you like a copy of the presentation? Raise your hand if you'd like a copy so that you can just listen to this. Because we're here to chill. We're here to um, master things. We're not here to learn things for the first time. Okay, so I'll give you a copy of this. So here... I made a table to compare osteosarcoma from Ewing sarcoma, two of the most common childhood uh, bone disorders you're going to encounter. So osteosarcoma affects classically the metaphysis. Ewing's is also diaphysis. Now question, what is the most common site of osteomyelitis? Is it metaphysis? or diaphysis, osteomyelitis. What does osteomyelitis usually affect? Okay, very good. Osteomyelitis is classically metaphysis, okay? So the presentation is actually similar between osteosarcoma and Ewing's. It's just Ewing's presents more of the constitutional signs of a malignancy, such as fever and weight loss. Both can present with local pain and swelling. Now, you have the sunburst pattern, and don't forget the Codman's triangle, which we mentioned earlier. And you have the lytic onion skinning periosteal reaction in Ewing's. Now, question What is the most common site of metastasis? Okay, most common site of metastasis for both osteosarcoma and Ewing's sarcoma. Where does it usually, where does it usually metastasize? Where does it usually metastasize? Okay, great. It is the lungs, okay? Osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma usually metastasizes to the lungs, okay? Now, what about rickets and osteomalacia? What is deficient here is classically vitamin D. But you have to remember if there is impaired metabolism of phosphate and calcium, this in turn would have counter-regulatory as well as regulatory mechanisms to affect vitamin D. So phosphate and calcium metabolism problems can also cause vitamin D deficiency. So please take note of this. So if there's vitamin D deficiency in children, that's rickets. There's vitamin D deficiency in adults, that's osteomalacia. Always remember yung adults yung malicious. Okay, adults are malicious. Sila yung malicia. Okay, so please take note of that. Now, the most common cause of osteomyelitis, okay, is staph areas. I want everyone to memorize that. Now, side question. What is the most common cause of osteomyelitis in a patient with sickle cell anemia? The most common cause 
of osteomyelitis in a patient with sickle cell anemia. Okay, so don't forget sickle cell, cell, cella, cella, ella, ella is salmonella, ella, ella. Okay, it is salmonella, okay, which is the most common cause of sickle cella, ella. Okay, very good. Okay, now, what about this condition called osteoporosis? These are the factors that would cause osteoporosis. We have age. We have the lack of calcium and vitamin D. Okay. Then we also have menopause, corticosteroids, and heparin. Please pay special attention to the last two because these are the pharmacologic causes of osteoporosis, okay? Now, uh, if this is the bone, sorry, medyo pangit yung bone, okay? And let me just tell you, this is the surgical neck. If there's a fracture of the surgical neck, what is the most common structure that would be injured? What is the most common structure that would be injured? Okay, most common structure that would be injured. Okay, very good. It's the axillary nerve. Okay, the axillary nerve. Very good. So if you have a patient with osteoporosis, where would the most common location be? Would it be at the trochanter or trochanteric? Or is it subcapital? Osteoporosis, location. Is it subcapital or is it trochanteric? Where would the most common location be if there is a fracture caused by osteoporosis? Where? Okay. I see answer stroke and tear it. Mm -hmm. So far, no one has got, gotten the correct answer. Not both. Okay. It is subcapital. Okay. Now, trochanteric and tear it starts with the letter T. This is the most common location of fractures in an osteoporotic patient who encounters trauma, okay? Trauma in young patients is usually trochanteric, okay? Let me rephrase that. Trochanteric is young patients, T, trauma. Osteoporotic fractures are usually subcapital, okay? Now, I want everyone to zoom into this. Very important, greater trochanter. Okay, make sure you follow me. Look at the greater trochanter. Okay, this is the femur, huh? This is the femur. This is the lesser trochanter. Now, I want everyone to remember, where is the trochanter found? Is the trochanter found in the femur or is it found in the humerus? Where's the trochanter? Okay, very good. So trochanter is femur. So what do you see in the humerus? What is the analog to this? And you, what do you see in the humerus? Okay, very good. In the humerus, you see the tubercle or the tuberosity. Okay, tubercle or the tuberosity. Now, here's the trochanteric line. Look at this. And here's the head of the femur. Now, question, what receives or articulates with the head of the femur? 
what receives or articulates with the head of the femur? What is received by the head of the femur? Okay, perfect. It is the acetabulum. And what type of joint is the hip joint? What type of joint is the hip joint? Okay, what type of joint? Okay. It's a ball and socket. Now question, what is the most common type of hip dislocation? Is it anterior or is it posterior? Hip dislocation. The hip dislocation is usually posterior. What about shoulder dislocation? What about shoulder dislocation? Shoulder dislocation is usually anterior. Okay, it's usually anterior. What about elbow dislocation? What about elbow dislocation? Elbow dislocation is usually posterior. So recap. What is the only anterior dislocation? Of the three joints I mentioned, what is the only anterior? It's the shoulder. It is the shoulder. Hip and elbow are posterior. Now question, what is the weakest part of the shoulder? And that is where dislocations usually occur. Where is the weakest part of the shoulder? The weakest part of the shoulder is inferior because there is no support there. And what are the group of muscles that supports the shoulder joint? Those famous group of muscles, we call them the rotator cuff muscles, okay? And the rotator cuff muscles, yes, you are correct. That is the sits, sup supraspinatus, infraspinatus, there is what? Is this minor or major? This is teres minor. What is the next S? What is the next S? Yung unang S is supraspinatus. This is the subscapularis. Now question. All of these muscles except for one are inserted into the greater tubercle. What is the exception? All are inserted into the greater tubercle. Three muscles. The exception is the subscapularis muscle. Because the subscapularis muscle is inserted where? Where is it inserted? Very good. Oops, not trochanter. Oh, wag ilagay sa paa. Not the trochanter. Be careful. Okay. It's the tubercle. Okay, it's the lesser tubercle. Okay, careful, huh? Be careful. Now, which of these muscles is responsible for the first 15 degrees of abduction? First 15 degrees of abduction. Okay, what's the first 15 degrees? Supra spinatus. Okay. Supraspinatus. Very good. Now, let's have a little mental exercise. Kaya pa? Are you guys still with me? Okay, give me a thumbs up if you're still with me. Thumbs up or raise your hand if you're still with me. I want to make sure I'm not alone. Okay. Still want to learn more? Okay, great. Now, same illustration or figure. So what if there is, I'm talking about the humerus, huh? The photo there, I apologize, is that of the femur. I'm referring to the humerus now. Mid shaft of the humerus, what nerve is damaged? Okay. That's the radial nerve. Okay. What about the nerve damage if there's a medial epicondyle? Fracture, medial epicondyle fracture. Okay, great. That's the ulnar. Now, what blood vessel is usually damaged or injured if there's a supracondylar fracture? Supra, 
condylar fracture. Very good. It's the brachial artery. Okay, the brachial artery. So the radial nerve is damaged in a mid shaft of the humerus fracture. The ulnar nerve is damaged in a medial epicondyle fracture. And the brachial artery is damaged if there's a supracondylar fracture. So the classic presentation of radial nerve palsy is a wrist drop. Okay, it's going to be a wrist drop. You might hear uh, terms like Saturday night palsy. Saturday night palsy. You might hear terms like crutch palsy. I'm finished. I'm basically summarizing everything in the multiple books. Wrist drop, Saturday night palsy, crutch palsy. I'd like to clarify a crutch palsy is not the axillary nerve. Now for the ulnar nerve, which we call the funny bone, okay, this can clinically present with a claw hand. I hope everyone got this, a claw hand. Now, what condition results from ischemic uh, contracture because of the brachial artery? What do we call that condition? It's an ischemic contracture. Okay, very good. It's a Volkmann's ischemic contracture. Now, the Volkmann ischemic contracture can also present with a claw hand. It can also present with a claw hand. Okay, it can also present with a claw hand. So please take note of that. Okay, so here, when you have a pulseless hand, look at the brachial artery here. Look at that. This is your clinical crossover. What type of contracture is associated with ischemia of the brachial artery? This is the Volkmann's. Okay, now there's another ischemic contracture in anatomy and surgery. This is associated with uremia. And aside from uremia, you're going to get contractures of the palmar aponeurosis. Okay, the palmar aponeurosis. Question, what is this type of contracture? Okay, what is this type of contracture? Okay, very good. This is a Dupuytren's contracture. Dupuytren's contracture. Okay, now here, here's an illustration showing you compartment syndrome. Okay, you usually get compartment syndrome either in the upper X or the lower extremities because the muscles there are compartmentalized. And always remember. When you have compartments, there's always the nav or the van. So there's a nerve, artery, and vein, which can be damaged whenever there is compartment syndrome. There's pain, there's swelling, there's paralysis, pallor, paresthesia, and pulselessness. Question, which is the earliest manifestation of compartment syndrome? Which is the earliest manifestation of compartment syndrome? Okay. Yung pinakauna is pain. Okay? Pulselessness, pallor, paresthesia, these are later. So pain is the earliest. Question, what is the management of compartment syndrome? Surgical management of compartment syndrome. Okay? This is fasciotomy. Okay? Fasciotomy is done in compartment syndrome. Okay, now what if there is compartment syndrome secondary to a burn? You do not do fasciotomy. What do you do if this is burns? Dahil sa burns. If this is a burn, then you do escarotomy. Okay, escarotomy. Very good. So please take note of that. Now, the next thing we want to remind you regarding the bones. Okay, so here's the carpal bones. I think you have encountered the famous uh, mnemonics for the carpal bones, which is some lovers 
try positions that they can't handle. Okay, so some lovers try positions that they can't handle. Okay, so please take note of this. Now let's play around a little here. So we have some very important things to go over. We actually mentioned a couple earlier. So the, the hamid is the most common dislocated carpal ball. If the hamid is injured or fractured, the ulnar nerve is injured. The scaphoid is the most common fractured carpal bone. That's why some people spell calf, scaphoid with the letter F, scaphoid F for fracture. If the scaphoid bone is fractured, then there's injury to the radial nerve. Okay. Now, correction, it's the lunate. So I stand corrected. Lunate is the dislocated bone, most common. Hamate can be dislocated, but it's not the most common dislocated. So correct that. Most common dislocated carpal bone. Most common dislocated carpal bone, okay, is the lunate. Then don't forget which is proximal and which is distal. Now for the common bone fractures, there's only two things I want you guys to remember here. One is the term commutated fracture, which means the bone breaks into two or more fragments, okay? Next is a green stick fracture, which is more common in children because their bones are more flexible or more pliable, okay? So that means it breaks on one side and it bends on the other. So that is the green stick fracture. Now, can you tell me what fracture presents with a dinner fork deformity? Dinner fork or silver fork deformity? Dinner fork or silver fork deformity? Okay, very good. That is a Collie's fracture. Dinner fork deformity is a Collie's fracture. So please take note of that. Now question, what fracture presents with a garden spade deformity? Okay, let's check who's reading the anatomy by more. Okay, garden spade. Okay, very good. The garden spade is a Smith's fracture. The Smith's fracture is also known as a reverse Collie's fracture. It's also known as a reverse Collie's fracture. Okay, reverse. Uh, yung nakasulat in uh, more is the term garden spade as well as snell. Okay. Now, the stages in the healing of a bone fracture. So first, there's the hematoma formation. Then the callus formation. It's actually a fibrocartilage callus formation the bony callus formation, then lastly, the bone remodeling. So what comes first is the fibrocartilage, then the bony callus formation. Now question, what type of collagen is fibrocartilage? What type of cart collagen is fibrocartilage? Okay, very good. It's type 2. Okay, it's type 2. Now, this is your clinical crossover. You will most likely get a similar case to this. You have a child. So here's an eight-year-old boy falling from a tree. The bone bends and cracks. Remember, a cracking sound is usually indicative of a fracture. So instead of breaking completely into separate pieces, the bone bends and cracks. What type of fracture? is this? What type of fracture is this? 
Okay, very good. This is a green stick fracture. Okay, this is a green stick fracture. Okay, this is a green stick fracture. Now, always remember that. Now, the three major types of cartilage. Okay, we have hyaline, we have fibrocartilage, then we have the elastic cartilage. Okay, so take note, hyaline, fibrocartilage, then elastic cartilage. Okay, so this is the histologic description of hyaline. Okay, you have a clear brown substance. In the fibrocartilage, you have dense collagen fibers. Then elastic, as the name indicates, you have the elastic fibers. So please take note of that. Okay, now, this is what you're going to expect in the exam. And this is most likely what's going to come out back and forth, back and forth. Okay, what are the examples of hyaline cartilage? It is B, L, T. Okay, very good. What is BLT? It's the bronchi, larynx, and trachea. Bronchi, larynx, and trachea. What is the example of fibrocartilage? Give me examples of fibrocartilage. Give me examples of fibrocartilage. Okay, very good. The intervertebral disc and the symphysis pubis. Very good. The intervertebral disc and the symphysis pubis, okay? Now, what are the examples? So intervertebral disc and the symphysis pubis. Now, what are examples of the elastic cartilage? There are three. E, epiglottis, E, you stake in tube of the ear, pin of the ear, and the other ear, the other E rather, okay, you stake in tube and the ears, okay, the pin of the ear, they are all letter E. So please take note of that. Now, your clinical crossover is this, the glycosaminoglycans, or what we call the GAGs. Now, can anyone tell me what glycosaminoglycans can you remember are found in hyaline cartilage? Okay, can you name a few? What glycosaminoglycans would you find in hyaline cartilage? Okay, we have hyaluronate or hyaluronic acid. Okay, what else? What else can you think of? Chondroitin, that's chondroitin sulfate. Okay, anything else you'd like to share? Yes, dermatan sulfate, heparan sulfate. Now, here is a table lifted from Harper's biochemistry. Now, 
you're going to get a copy of this table. I'm going to give you a heads up. Patho Biochempedia. So let me repeat. Patho Biochem and Pediatrics have been repeatedly asking questions from this table. Okay. So I want you guys to remember this. The one that will pop out is most likely Ehlers syndrome. This is MPS, which stands for mucopolysaccharidosis, MPS1. Know the enzyme deficient, which is iduronidase. Take note of the GAGs, which are affected. It's dermatan and heparan sulfate. Now, something is very unique about Hurler syndrome, which is not found in the others. And this is the presence of the corneal clouding. Okay, The corneal clouding is because of the accumulation of glycosaminoglycans in the cornea. Now, question. What is eye cell disease? Okay, what is eye disease? cell disease. Okay, this is a mucolipidosis or mucopolysaccharidosis. Why is it called eye cell? Okay. And what is the usual manifestation of eye cell disease? Okay. What is deficient? Okay, very good. It's the NAG T1, okay? NAG T1 is N-acetylglucosamine phosphotransferase gene, okay? N-acetylglucosamine, okay? N-acetylglucosamine phosphotransferase 1. Would anyone happen to know which MPS is eye cell disease? Is it one, two, or three? Is it one, two, or three? So is this one, two, or three? It's not number one. Eye cell disease is not MPS1. It is MPS2. Okay, that's MPS2. Okay, that is MPS2. All of these other fancy names here, you can crash them out. Hurler, Hunter, and the lease is San Filippo. Okay. So please take note of that. Now, next, another clinical crossover. We mentioned earlier that osteogenesis imperfecta affects collagen type 1. Cartilage is cartilage, and the blood vessels, which has three layers, that's type three. So that affects the vascular type of Ehlers Danlos syndrome. Then we have type four which is Alport syndrome. Type 4 is the basement membrane. Please memorize this. Yung pinaka-paborito dito is the question on type 2 and type 4, Alports. Please remember that. So here's Alport syndrome. So they usually present with uh, hereditary nephritis and deafness. Okay, hereditary nephritis and deafness. That is the usual presentation. So here I'd like to add this. This is lifted from your book. Uh, Alport syndrome, aside from the famous deafness and nephritis, okay, this is X-linked. That means it's only males will manifest 
it presents with these two opta findings. One is the anterior lenticonus. Second is the posterior corneal dystrophy. Anterior lenticonus. Then we have the posterior corneal dystrophy. Now here is another table lifted from Harper's. We actually mentioned most of these cases, but I just want to touch from the book because this is how you top the exam. So first, dwarfism. It's deficiency of growth hormone, and that is before the epiphyseal plates close. Next is rickets, which is vitamin D deficiency. This is in childhood or children. Then we have osteomalacia, which is vitamin D deficiency in adults. And I just want you to be familiar with this condition, chondrodysplasia, okay, chondrodysplasia. Then we have hyperparathyroidism, so too much parathyroid, so increased parathyroid, pataas ng calcium. So what you're going to get is increased calcium. And excess parathyroid hormone is associated with an increase in the resorption of bone. And here's the osteogenesis imperfecta. So this is the mutation, the COLA1 and COLA2. Okay. So osteogenesis imperfecta can present with a chondroplasia and thanatophoric dysplasia. Okay. So please take note of this. Okay. Again, please take note of this. Now, what about the joints? Okay, fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints, synovial joints. I want everyone to remember the synovial. These are the freely movable joints. The fibrous are immovable. The cartilaginous are both immov immovable, but some are slightly movable. So what you bring with you to the boards are the synovial joints. Okay, which are the freely movable joints. Now, as to the functional classification of joints, a joint is either senarthrosis, amphiarthrosis, or diarthrosis. Question, what is the functional classification of the knee joint? What is the functional classification of the knee joint? Tuhod. Knee joint. Okay, very good. So the knee joint is a diarthrosis. Okay, the knee joint is diarthrosis. Okay, so please remember that. Now here, the fibrous joints allow no movement. They are basically uh, joined by fibrous tissue. And a classic example here is the sutures of the skull. Okay. Now, what do we call the condition where there is premature or early closure of the sutures of the skull? Okay, very good. That's cranial synostosis. So please take note of this. Now here for the fibrous joints, so we have here the sutures, as you can see here, they are only found in the skull. So sutures here are found in the skull. And then we have this term syndemosis. Okay. When we say syndemosis, these are bones that are connected by ligaments. Okay. If you notice the recent questions in the anatomy exam, yung sobrang detalye, malalim na siya sa book. Okay, these are examples of this. So examples of syndis, syndemosis is the talofibular ligament, the interosseous ligament, 
of the radius and the ulna. Okay? The interosseous membrane of the radius and the ulna. Now, question. What is the most common ankle joint that is sprained? The most common, not ankle joint, rather, sorry, not ankle joint, but ankle ligament. Okay, I stand corrected. What ligament okay, is usually sprained in the ankle? Okay, very good. It's the anterior talofibular joint. Okay, uh, ligament rather, the anterior talofibular ligament. anterior talofibular ligament. Now here, very important term, the peg in a socket. This is known as the gomphosis. Gomphosis is only found in the teeth or the alveoli of the teeth. So here, the young alveolar process, the socket. So please take note of this term, gomphosis. Okay. So please don't forget this. I hope you, you got these two terms, syndemosis and gomphosis. Now, always remember there's cartilaginous joints or bones which are connected by a cartilage. And they are mostly amphiarthrosis. Okay. And the classic example here is the pubic synthesis and the intervertebral joints. Okay, the pubic synthesis and the intervertebral joints. Now, for the synovial joints, these are freely moving joints. I want everyone to memorize this. It's the most common type of joint. Can you give me examples of a synovial joint? So this is the ball and socket. Can you give me specific examples? Okay, specific examples. Okay, glenohumera. Very good. Okay, glenohumeral is also known as the shoulder joint. Okay, the hip joint. What is the anatomic name of the hip joint? Tama yung hip joint. Hip joint. What do we call the hip joint? If the shoulder is glenohumeral, what is the name of the hip joint? Ano yung anatomic or medical term for the hip joint? Anyone? Acetabulo femoral joint. Okay. Medyo mahaba yan, ha? Tongue twister. Acetabulo. Okay. 
femoral joint. Okay, very good. Now, always remember this. The synovial joints are usually affected by arthritis. It's usually affected by arthritis. Okay, now here's a photo. Here's your synovial membrane. There. This is where the joint fluid would be found. Okay, so this is when they do arthrocentesis. They poke the needle. They extract the joint fluid. Now here, very beautiful picture, head of the femur, a uh, humerus rather, sorry, head of the humerus. Here is the more or less where the surgical neck would be found. Okay, and this is the joint capsule. Okay, this is part of the acromion which has been cut. Very very beautiful picture. Okay, now there is a space in the shoulder known as the quadrangular space. We'll be talking about this this afternoon, but I wanna mention this as early as now. The quadrangular space, okay. There are two very important structures that pass in the quadrangular space. What are these two important structures? Okay, can anyone share with me? Yes, tama si axillary nerve. Okay, tama si axillary nerve. Okay. What else? Okay. Make it complete, not just circumflex. It is posterior humeral. Okay. Posterior humeral circumflex vessels. So that's the posterior humeral circumflex artery and vein. Okay. So please take note of this. Okay, again, please take note of this. Now, winding up, we have here the synovial joint shape types. Okay, I'll give you a copy of this. So the plane joints, this is the intercarpal. Hinge, take note, huh? the hinge joints. This is the elbow, ankle, and interphalangeal. The radio ulnar is actually a pivot joint. Condyloid, that's metacarpophalangeal. And the saddle joint, ito yung paborito sa exam. Okay? This is the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb. Now, question. What do you call a fracture of metacarpal one? What do we call that fracture? What's the eponym? Metacarpal one. Metacarpal one is the thumb. This is a Bennett's fracture. Na be Bennett, okay? The Bennett's fracture, okay? And what do we call a fracture of the fourth and the fifth metacarpal? Okay, this is the boxer's fracture. Okay, this is the boxer's fracture. And what is your diagnosis kung positive yung Phelan sign? And Tinel sign. Okay, what is your diagnosis? Okay, this is carpal tunnel syndrome. And what nerve is compressed in carpal tunnel syndrome? Okay, the nerve that is compressed is the median nerve. Okay. Very good. It's the median nerve. Now, there is a test where you occlude the radial and the ulnar artery. You want to check the patency. Okay, you want to check the patency of the circulation there. So my question is, what is this test? Okay, very good. This is Allen's test. Okay, this is Allen's test. Okay, Allen's test. So please take note of this. Okay. So that ends our 
first module. Actually, it's worth two to three modules 